Commissioner Priester. I am here. Yeah. Commissioner Pelton. Here. Commissioner Bond. Here. And Commissioner Goodman. Here. And as we discussed earlier, Commissioner Tomaszewski is at the hospital with the accreditation board and thus is an excused absence under our bylaws. Any amendments to the agenda? Mm, none. Any public comments on the agenda items? All right, and the consent agenda then with the financial statements and the minutes and the rest of the stuff, all the asterisk starred items. Move to approve. I so move. Second. I'm going to give it a second line of are you seconding? Okay, all right. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Who seconded? I didn't quite catch it. Dale. Dale. That takes us down. Dale. 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 Okay. No resolutions this month. That's kind of unusual. No, that's... Takes okay. us down to old business. None. New business, none. The discussion of the 2023 fiscal public year, year public housing and domestic violence grant budgets, no action required. Can we just get a, just a quick a high 5,000 foot view of what that is in the amount, just briefly? The, that domestic violence the, grant budget? Oh, the domestic violence, um, we received a grant in 2000, seven you know eight from mishta when they had um a program that michael devos put out on um purchasing homes for long-term um uh, living for victims of domestic violence and uh, we uh, won a, a five hundred thousand dollar grant and the grant is um it, it's a loan forgiveness grant so every 10 years 25 percent of the grant is um, forgiven we've already cycled through all three of them for one 10-year period and they're based on when the mortgage was created with mishta um, so they're they all didn't fall on the same day so we have three different days and the primary target as any victim of domestic violence um, in Manistee County. And then <clears throat> we've ran into issues with um, not being able to get recommendations from domestic violence shelters because uh, it was set up originally that they would notify us of who needs to be, who's next in their mm -hmm. moving in. And, um, and, and, you know, we've looked to partner so that Mishta then had us expand um, to all the counties surrounding, and we still had difficulty getting it. And it wasn't just us, but all the other programs are having trouble to get that referral. Then they opened it up to all northern Michigan, and then all central Michigan had theirs, and mm -hmm. southern Michigan. Um, and um, we have been able to keep um, domestic violence uh, victims, you know, in the homes. Um, now, I think we have one vacancy mm -hmm. at this point, um, and uh, we're working on getting that filled with a, a person that qualifies, you know, under the Michigan terms. Mm -hmm. um, it's long-term living, so they can, you know, I think our longest one's been there. Oh, gosh. Um, I would say over, it's between 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So... There's no termination of the program kind of thing. Is this the Fifth Avenue house that is uh, part of that grant? That's one of the that's one of the homes. We try not to publicly speak of the locations wow. of the units. So you so do we so the the referral has to come through a domestic violence organization or maybe law enforcement? Or I mean um I, their preference is a domestic violence shelter, mm -hmm. um, but if 
we have difficulty, they'll, they've opened it up to wherever we can get them from. And then if we can't get any recommendation, they don't want the house sitting open, and then we're able to put a public housing family mm. you know, in there. However, they have to move out if we have sure. a um, domestic violence victim family to go in there. Um, so, you know, we try to seek that first, you know, to keep it, you know, for those individuals and families. I can think of in my previous position doing outpatient therapy, I've had um, persons that were living in domestic violent relationships. Mm -hmm. The police had been involved on the periphery, but um, they didn't go to a shelter or anything. Mm -hmm. So, just thinking yeah, about those. If we have a if you know of people with recommendations, that would be helpful because that's where you know, we'd like to go first. Okay. Um, it, and the lease is a little bit different. Mishta has this built in that we have to receive all the information about the perpetrator. <coughs> and the perpetrator is not allowed on the property for any reason. So. Oh, great. So is that what the dwelling rental revenue is from the grant that covers is that what that means on that page, one page is the last page of our agenda? Uh, which? It says under the DVG grant budget. Uh-huh. So 21000 dwelling rental revenue. Just can you, I just explain what okay. that is then? On the, are you looking at this budget here? Yeah, the, the draft, the DVG grant budget. Okay, that's our anticipated rent paid for by the, the residents of the homes. And um, uh, sometimes payment comes in through tribal support. Sometimes payment comes in through Section 8 uh, support. Um, Mishta has, in the recent years, after they were audited by HUD, have pushed the, the rates of rental up to closer to fair market. And we've argued with them that that isn't fair for the families that we're supposed to serve. And so we try to keep them, you know, um, within. When it was originally started, we were permitted to do 30% um, of AMI, you know, for, for people, you know, get the rent really low and 30% of their gro adjusted gross income. But um, now they keep on, you know, I think the rate for our three bedrooms is to 12, 12 or 1300 a month is what they want. Yeah, it's close to 1200 Yeah. I think it's 1180 something. Yeah. Which is exorbitant for the families that we're trying to serve. This is based, though, on what we've collected in the previous year, making a projection, you know, moving forward. The budget for the domestic violence grant pretty much remains the same year in, year out. Um, MISHTA was supposed to fund a super fund that provided for um, long-term upkeep and such. And after Michael DeVos was no longer there, that all got disappeared. <clears throat> and so um, whatever income that we make off this just goes back into the pot that we have um, to maintain those homes. and. Uh, take care of the items. Um, all of these funds by MISTA regulations are in a separate account from a separate bank than um, all of our other funds. So, And the $10,000 management fee, I think I heard you ask about that, that is the fee that's paid to the Housing Commission to manage those properties. So. And that's two properties, you said? Three. Oh, three. Okay. Yeah. Since we're on the domestic violence grant proposal, that since that's pretty straightforward, um, those homes were intentionally bought. They, they were newer and, and well-maintained um, homes. So we've been fortunate that the general costs have not been high. And we've been on top of replacing of water heaters and furnaces um, and, and stuff like that. I suspect in the next few years, we're gonna 
have roofing needs that are going to happen, you know, for us, and um, that all has to be contained within that this budget. So we have to figure those out as they come. Not in that second phase rad thing. These are no, totally these separate. that these are absolutely separate because they're not considered public housing. They're they're owned by Mishta through the loan grant mm -hmm. <laughs> that we have. Yeah. So. So you just manage them for Mishta then. Basically. We own we own them because of the grant award that we being the housing commission owns them by the grant award, and we have to follow the terms of the grant, um, and we make annual reports you know, that they require. Um, the only thing I argue with them about is the continuing raising of the base rental costs. Um, because it doesn't match with what our families can can afford. So I imagine that our maintenance is already kind of, like you said, they're already looking at the roof, which down the road, you know, so I'm mm -hmm. sure we have some sort of maintenance plan looking at this stuff. Yeah. Because this is Mishta and it's grant operated, funded, um, does that limit us in ability to seek other grants to help subsidize and care for these houses? Are, is that a, are they a limited grant? They don't allow you to, do you know that? Um, I'm not positive on that. I know what I have pursued is, you know, what happened to the super fund that was supposed to be created. Um, and then how do we take care of, you know, if there's catastrophic, you Now they're all insured, but if there's, you know, catastrophic needs, mm -hmm. you know, in that. And their answer has been, well, you have to take care of it within the budget that you have. <laughs> so um, I can ask them and see if there's any limitation. I don't, probably wouldn't be since they're just putting it back on us. They do come up once a year um, and um, perform their inspection you know, on each unit kind of thing. That's impressive. They stick yeah. to that. That is impressive. Yeah. Well, they hadn't done that for like the first eight or nine years. <laughs> and then they were audited by HUD. Yeah. And then they've done that, right. you know, ever since. But they, they come up regularly. And, you know, it, it's set up to protect the families. Mm -hmm. um, we know when they're coming and mission notifies them. And then they have the choice if they want an additional female to be there, mm -hmm. you know, with them. You know, um, so and our guys never go by themselves. And usually, if the, if a, the person asks for a, a female mm -hmm. person to be there, um, then one of the staff goes over with them. Okay. And stuff. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that budget? I can walk us through our proposed operating. Budget. The um, just a little background on the operating budget. Um, HUD requires that we submit a budget, even though the budget may be changed based on their funding and such. Um, by the first week of January and has to go to the Detroit field office. If that budget isn't in there to the field office, then we um, jeopardize receiving operating fund grant uh, and we also jeopardize receiving capital fund grants. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we always work towards getting that totally um, submitted and then of course we have to make adjustments based on their funding. Based on the separation of uh, two-thirds of our public housing units now being under a private entity and not having the trial balances yet from um, our auditor uh, to be able that he would submit to HUD and then be able to have our books, we based our income on what we have 
received so far in rental collection from residents and what we've received so far and these are 12 month projections that we do um, on the excess utilities uh, excess utility is um, particularly <coughs> Uh, it comes down to water charges. They're allowed so much utility expenditure in water usage, and above that, then they're charged um, a rate, and that all just comes off of the bill we receive from the city, and then they have to pay us back for that um, to follow HUD um, protocols. And other revenue uh, comes from uh, if there's any maintenance charges, any late fees, um, that's where, um, let's see, oh, what, what else goes in there, Cindy? My brain is stopping here. Um, yeah, like it's like, you know, whatever things that we need to receive um, from the tenants that you know, for charges and stuff like that that, that come through on that. Um, Can I just ask, so just get my head clear here. This operating budget for 2023 is based only on the scatter site. That's correct. Cool. All right. I'll it's only scatter. <laughs> yep. What would laundry revenue be? Do you have a laundry site for scatter? Yeah, we have one of our, <clears throat> one of our, one of the duplexes that were created um, has uh, on a unit on one side and the other side, which I think we have, I think there's two washers and two dryers um, in there. Mm -hmm. um, and they're coin operated because mm -hmm. um, they don't receive much use. All of our homes have hookups for if people have their own washer and dryer. So this is in case people, people don't. And that's what the income is on that, the, the revenue. Um, Do you own the machines or are they leased machines? They're um, leased through WASH. Okay. Um, we just maintain a contract with them. And, yeah. So um, let's see. Interest income is interest that we earn from um, public housing funds in the bank. And... Um, other revenue are things that come in, like uh, if we get um, funds from the insurance company because we've done well in having low claims or something like that, we get extra, it's a cooperative um, for public housing authorities, so we get refunds on that. Um, fraud recovery, the former executive director who embezzled over $2 million is still paying um, you know, back restitution. And so that's the ballpark. We never know when a check is coming, how much a check is going to be, you know, and we can go m months and months on end without seeing or something, we get a large check kind of thing. So it comes from the Department of Justice through the Grand Rapids office. Then you see there the $10,000 that comes from the domestic violence grant program for the management. So. We're projecting um, based on, and, and I, I skipped over because of a question. Let me go back up to where it says HUD, public housing grant revenue. <clears throat> There's two streams of operational support um, that come from HUD. One is operating grant through CFP, the Capital Funds Program, um, based on what was received for this year and available for operating grants for um, the family sites. That's what we're projecting. We do not know how to anticipate what's gonna happen from HUD in that part of the rate we received was because we had an energy performance contract, which we no longer have, which was paid off by the, the RAD closing in total. Um, and their calculations based on um, our sizes and the conditions of the units. Operating subsidy 
is based on what we received this year also. We will not know from HUD, they, they've just begun the operating fund procedure, <clears throat> have submitted the executive director form that's required. Uh, we won't have knowledge until between March and June is when we'll get confirmation from HUD what the actual grant is. We will have to do submissions and stuff, but we won't know what the operating fund will be until then. I think um, it will hold pretty close to this, but um, I, I just don't know how they will calculate things um, down. And the same thing with the capital funds. Um, they could come as early as May, and I've seen them as late as August um, to be you know, released to us. So um, as soon as they're released, we pull down the amount that they allow for operating um, funds. Uh, but those are calculations that have always been subject to um, funding appropriation uh, from Congress and then HUD's calculations and such. Any questions on the income before I start going through the, okay. Expenses, um, when it, you'll see different items that show, represents the Housing Commission's portion, 22.3% of the entire cost because the contract with CTHV Limited Dividend Housing Association um, is pays the balance by the contract to use the staff. Okay, so maintenance. Um, let's see, I'm probably on the wrong page now here. Um, administrative wages. That is the portion for the housing commission. Um, the rest is paid for by the um, new property entity. The legal expense, um, that's the amount, you know, based on what we need for evictions and so on. Um, no funding is put there in staff training. Most of the staff training will be funded through CTHV. Accounting fees, um, we're holding close to what we have paid in the past, but we've needed to bring the accounting um, into house with BDO uh, just to simplify the entire process because of the um, division between them and being sure the assets were are cared for and properly accounted for. We stabbed at the auditing fee. Currently our auditing fee is just under $9,000 for all public housing as in the past. Not sure what our auditor will charge just for 48 units and the reduction of costs. The um, cost this year will be much more than normal and CTHV will eat the costs of anything above their share of the 77.7%. .7%. Again, you have the benefits and the telephone, that's the Housing Commission's portion uh, no publication charges, membership dues and fees. Um, there are a few memberships that are public housing specific that um, it behooves us to maintain. So we left them in there, push comes to shove, first thing eliminated. Administrative service contracts, those are contracts like um, on the copier, the um, uh, postage machines, um, I should have written this all down, help me out. Oh, our maintenance on our um, network and our security systems for our electronic data. Um, those are the kind of items that are in there. Um, again, CTHV is paying a, a much greater portion of that cost overall. Office supplies, same thing. This is just a portion uh, for the Housing Commission. 
Um, other sundry and miscellaneous, I'd always want something in there, and that's just for your miscellaneous. I prefer the lower, lowest number possible there because I don't like unaccounted numbers. Um, the um, public and other services, that is funds that um, $25 per occupied unit one time per year are funds available for residents needs or uh, organizations or or whatever we have 2400 that we use for a resident employee stipend we have a woman who um, lives in the scattered sites who maintains the laundry unit uh, keeps it clean be sure everything is you know working fine and HUD provides that um, those folks receive $200 um, a month and um, it's an excluded income, so it cannot be included against anything like public housing, um, uh, TANF funds, food stamps, it's all excluded because it's coming from um, a federal authority. Um, these are, the utilities are pretty much based on, and these are what our charges are for the um, scattered sites. <clears throat> the um, the billing and payments um, for 2022. And that's just the vacant ones? That's because they pay their own, right? Um, we have several units because they were um, not built as duplex units. And the water and electricity and gas were not split at the time so we pay full expense on those units um, and those residents do not receive utility allowances because um, the housing authority is paying the full how many of those units are there there are one bedroom units um, and i want to say i think there's eight one bedroom units mm -hmm. that have that i think there's four structures um, and then I think it's also the, the um, laundry room also, which is a two bedroom because mm -hmm. the laundry room is connected to that unit. So we yeah. cover those utilities. That's a lot of water for the many units. Well, this is the cost item. This is based on billing that we receive from the city. And so it's not, this is not based on usage numbers. This is actual cost items that we pay. So. Good for the city. Yeah. Not good for the housing plan, good for the city. Yeah. Um, maintenance and operations, you know, again, you'll see the 22.3%. Um, the um, our maintenance employees um, are under a contract with um, United Steel Workers, which expires um, in August. Um, so we, they're unionized, okay? Yeah. And there's three of them, right? Um, yeah, we have three at this time. Yeah. And they work all they work all scattered and CH whatever CTHV. Yeah, they yeah they they do both and. You know, I, I send them where the need is, not where, oh, you've already spent your 22.3% this week, so no work okay. at the scattered site. So they, they go where need need to be taken care of. Um, materials, this is really just kind of, you know, making a good guess at it because normally our materials budget when um, we were larger was around forty two forty five thousand um, dollars most of these materials are you know just you know wall patching and door replacement and, and those kind of items um, heating and cooling um, that's basically the cost of the required annual inspections that we have to do on our um, 
heaters, our boilers, our hot water heaters, and the forced air units that we have. Our maintenance um, department uh, does the landscaping and grounds, except sometimes we have things that we um, hire out to local landscapers um, because it's an intense job and they have more of equipment and stuff. Unit contract uh, turnarounds, um, that's for things that may have to occur that our, our guys can't take care of um, uh, biohazards mainly is what's covered there. Electrical contracts and plumbing contracts are there um, because we have to have licensed workers to do that work and if there's something that needs to be done we have a placeholder there. Um, miscellaneous contracts is if something pops up um, hmm, I can't think of the name of the company that comes and runs that unplugs to the street. Forbes. Forbes. That's where we put Forbes in, you know, to take care of items. And then employee benefits. The um, insurance um, for the buildings and let's see here. Does that include the trucks in there or is that just the building? The trucks okay so <clears throat> the auto insurance prorated at 22.3 percent but the building insurance is at a hundred percent for that compensated absences everyone understands that concept correct right okay is that your PTO yeah that's the accumulated absences that we might have to pay out at some given time yeah it's now Several years ago, it became a GASB requirement of reporting um, and such, and recording into your budget uh, payment for that. That is, the 22,000 there represents just what the Housing Commission portion would be. It's much larger than that. Um, collection losses, you know, people who don't pay or people who pass away and their estates can't pay and so on. Um, let's see here. Then you see the um, truck that we have in the replacement costs of equipment. Those are, we have one truck yet that we're um, paying a lease on. And um, these portions again are just the split of the contract. Um, so we anticipate um, at the end of the year um, a $4,742 profit. Um, that's before capital expenditures that are then taken out, which reduces it to fourteen hundred and one dollar. Any questions I can answer? We don't make any decisions today. It's a, sort of a discussion time, and um, our next meeting in December is when we will approve each budget separately. So, how long does the subsidizing of everything occur with the sales. I, if I look at this budget, I, I'm concerned uh, because without them, it's drastic. It, it's, it, it's established that um, <clears throat> well, in perpetuity, basically the way the contracts are set up right now, that the Housing Commission um, will have this contract. Okay. Then with CTHV, then with phase two, then there's a potential, depending on negotiations and everything, that um, all employees would move into the new entity or there would be a continuation of a contract paying back to the Housing Commission staff, you know, for the Housing Commission staff to run and operate. Um, all of the assets such as copiers, truck, tractors, mowers, power tools, et cetera, are owned by the Housing Commission. Um, and so 
if there ever was a, a switch in the contract where there wasn't operating as it is now, there would have to be payment for assets such as those. Um, yeah, the housing but, commission would receive. Yeah, the housing commission would receive funds. If you want to sell it. Right. You know, it would have to be a negotiated, right. you know, based on things. But um, right now, there hasn't been much discussion beyond trying to get phase one finished and operating um, and trying to determine what can and may happen with phase two of the, for the houses. HUD has, um, the Detroit field office doesn't want more than $5,000 spent on each home to keep them habitable. I've just approved two roofing contracts um, from Bob's Roofing for um, 6150 I think it is, per roof. But um, as a health and safety issue, we need the roofs taken care of, and so I figure I can justify that you know, to HUD on that one. But, um, you know, as you have said several times, Karen, we, we need to begin addressing and discussing uh, the scattered sites and um, how to, um, you know, address these. HUD is committed to have their properties converted by RAD. So they, they keep on pushing, you know, me on when are we going to get moving on the RAD conversion, you know, on the properties. So. And yeah, because we'll have to, again, since we started this and to now, there is definitely a significant difference in costs, you know, mm -hmm. and all of that. You know, HUD can push all they want, but it's like if we can't afford it, I mean, are they going to come up with it? They're not going to. No, their, their solution is that, yeah, you can afford it through the RAD conversion. Yeah. So th that's, that's their on that. And then the other thing we have is that we have three units that are offline under long-term modernization. Um, you have two years once they're placed on that status to bring them up to standard. Uh, if not, then you lose the annual contributions contract on those, which is the operating subsidy. So the anniversary of those three units for year one is April 25, 2023. And then after next April, we have 12 months to have come up with a plan that is acceptable to HUD, because HUD has to agree to anything that we do. Well, in a time when, you know, housing and, and uh, affordable housing and all that stuff is uh, a pivotal uh, issue, you know, we can't afford to lose anything. Right. I mean, we, mm -hmm. uh, publicly, we would, I, I would imagine the public would be very upset with us <laughs> if we said, oh, yeah, we had three, but they slid past us. We weren't able right. to take care of it. So I think that is going to be an issue that we have to resolve and make mm -hmm. sure that we have a plan. Are, are, is that the 10th Street units? Um, we have two on 10th, and then we have one on Vine. I think the Vine one is what I went in with you on. Yeah, it's a four bedroom that yeah. that's what we destroyed. Over my tenure, we've put in close to 30,000 into that one particular four bedroom unit because of tenant damages. So it's so the deadline is the four twenty five twenty three for the two tenth and the Vine Street. Yeah, that's to year have a year plan. one. Yeah, that's year one, and that only leaves us twelve months. So the the actual cutoff date is April twenty five twenty twenty four. We don't have a plan that HUD has agreed to, and signed off on because it's their property. Um, then they will just it's automatic. I mean, they can't stop it at the field office. DC can't stop it. It's put in effect by Congress back in 1997, and it will just end on those. And, and then could the Housing Commission sell them at that point to an investor? Um, those properties, though not subsidized, would still be owned by HUD. 
and HUD would have to approve whatever is done with those properties. It is a possibility. It, it is a possibility, but I mean, we would have to go through their Chicago office um, to um, state why we want to sell them to the, that, and then, of course, any proceeds of selling something like that would be restricted for use for only for um, the development of extremely low income housing, which they now is they consider 50% of AMI and below. Um, and so we only could use it for that. So, if, so do we have bids on, on Vine Street? Is, is, do we have bids on 10th Street for renovation right now? I had received bids to do the fourth, the four bedroom and the two units on 10, and it was in excess of 160,000. And the field office said, you cannot spend those monies on those homes. Right, and was this local bidders? What kind of bidders were these? Um, I didn't do a formal bid. I did a exploration bid, and we used ServPro, because they have a very detailed system that will provide right down to whatever single cost is in the number of units and things. And those are the things that HUD wants when you have an expiration bid. Um, a formal bid would be as if we're putting it out with the intention of having it redone. We needed to get what's the cost of these and determine if HUD would, and that's when they came back and said you cannot spend those funds um, on bringing them up. You need to pursue RAD. or more reasonable bids, but. Um, no, the field office told me that we are not allowed to spend funds on rehabbing those homes. So we would have to get clearance from the field office to spend anything over $5,000 to rehab those homes. And, and they realize they're sitting there vacant, right? They know exactly everything. It's all computerized. We have to submit everything uh, of people moving in, moving out, their incomes, how many people are in their family, their social numbers, their driver's license, their birth certificates. They know everything about our residents and our vacant units. So um, they're in the driver's seat on their property, and that's where they're pushing it. The reason they push RAD is because the prediction is there will not be public housing funds in the future to maintain public housing. And so they're trying to push nationally across all public housing authorities such a conversion. Dale was having a reaction to his Moderna booster. Is he okay? Dale? Yeah. You okay? He came in having a reaction to that. And I wonder what shot by that. Anything else? Clinton? Well, we're just doing questions right now, but I just, I couldn't tell if you were breathing over there. <laughs> so. any, any other questions that I can provide for? Well, I just, I'm going to just keep going back to, I, again, you know, and I, everybody knows this, everybody can see it. Um, we'll go to 44 scattered sites and I'm very concerned we can't afford, we can't afford staff, we can't afford insurance, I, you know. I in mean, the current setup, it was anticipated that we would be in this position. And that's why everything was built that the bulk of the costs are covered by CTH3 limited dividend. Because um, there wouldn't be the funding support. Yeah. And I get that, and, and you know, and that's working but I'm already thinking down the road. Yeah. It's like, this is a huge difference. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've removed one huge, large piece of this entity. Yes. However, we've also put in $13.5 million into investment in these properties that would not have come in mm -hmm. without yeah. the RAD conversion. All right. I think that's all the questions so far. Do you know if you guys have any additional questions, 
shoot me an email and I'll um, respond to everyone with your question and provide uh, data and so on. So we're done presenting the two budgets for 2023. And I think we're now at the point of uh, reports and communications. I have no other report uh, other than what, you know, the budget stuff and other information I have provided to you guys over um, email. Cindy or? I don't have any reports. Okay. And we receive? Any executive report on that? Nope. No, we're good right now. Staff, anybody? No, they're fine. Just checked with them. I have a concern. Well, we have public comment. Dale, we have public comment before commissioners. Yeah. Well, not the no, no, I read that wrong. Right. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yep, it's commissioner time. Yep. I had something. Anyway. You. you know, it, I had something. Yeah. But it says that we're limited to the housing commission, the scattered units. But I'm concerned that the response has been no responses offered to the comments that we received from the public last time. How do they solve that? Does Riverside Housing have a, a forum for public comment? Um, no, um, Riverside Housing is a private corporation and so is um, CTHV, it's a private corporation. Resolving resident concerns involves residents communicating to management their issues and concerns just like any other privately owned and managed <coughs> um, apartment complex in any community is. Um, we did hold a, <coughs> excuse me, a meeting with um, residents of um, the uh, Century Terrace building and uh, Bill Gamble I um, asked him to be our moderator for us, and we had a good meeting. It went a little bit over an hour, um, I think. And um, we're still putting together notes from the meeting, which we intend then to send to all the residents, even those who weren't there. Um, but um, we haven't gotten that you know, finished yet. I had several items that I sent off to the owner uh, entity, uh, our Commonwealth connection on this, and um, they addressed some without informing me, but I have not hit, had an official response back to them from them um, about several of my other concerns that were raised uh, by the residents. So, I guess that my, my question would be um, last month's public comment. Was there any resolution for these issues that were people brought up? Or were I, just I took them, since I'm here as a managing agent, into advisement and I've shared them with individuals um, above me and um, have worked to address them. Um, so. Well, the, they're not our residents, though. They're not our residents anymore. They're not our residents. Yeah, I know they're not our residents. Yeah. And, um, you know. They are in a form of public This is true, and I, I get that. That's kind of what I've been saying. You know, it's like this, this is so muddy that it, you know, it, I guess I, you know, in my in my head when I think about business, I think, you know, I'm still connected to this LLC. They can be as private as they want. However, we're sharing some costs, and so we're in a partnership. So, you know. But there's limited definitions around the connection. The connection between the Housing Commission and Riverside is the statutory requirement of four positions of directors, and, and that's where it ends. And the responsibility of 
the entity is to provide annual financial reports back to the housing commissioners. So, um, it, uh, Jeff Klug um, will be coming on December 13th, helping the commissioners understand their new roles and the divisions, because this is not uncommon, the muddiness and trying to gain clarity for housing authorities that have had these RAD conversions. And so he will be bringing um, information to help. I, I feel like I get the basic concept. The fact is, is that we're still tied to them. Yeah, and, and so he will that, help explain that. that. Gets it, yeah. Gets it. And, and again, I'm not talking about putting it in a contract. I'm not talking about having language. I'm talking about what Dale's saying. We're still in this together. We may not be, you know, have a contract or whatever that says specifically that the Housing Commission is partnering, but let's be good stewards. And, um, and I said this at a, another meeting, I'm not feeling that the love. <laughs> I'm not feeling like they're, I, I don't know, I'm just getting this, and you guys work for them, but I, I I just get this feeling like, okay, we're a big corporation and our limited like corporation and we're gonna do what we wanna do and thanks a lot. And I and no. I just it just doesn't feel it just doesn't yeah. feel comfortable. I, I think that when Jeff is here and helps explain things, he can help clear it up for everyone because as staff we have questions about how much leverage we have with the other portions of the entity to make things happen that we don't really? agree with no. them on. Um, and so <clears throat> that, that's an important piece all around. Um, with his experience in dealing with this, um, I have high anticipation that he's gonna help us figure this out in a way that we can manage it and continue to manage it in a way that's beneficial for the company, but also beneficial for the residents. Because the entire reason of doing this was to improve these buildings um, for residents and to provide um, health and safety improvements that could not otherwise have been accomplished um, and to you know address them. But on the other side then, um, it's now private, and um, I hear that a lot, that it's private and you can't do this and you can't do that. So um, it just needs to be kind of washed out and understood on how that goes. I haven't heard from them since I sent my lengthy email to, to them about items that were raised at the resident meeting at Century Terrace, so. Public? No. no. We've got a public. Oh, we do. Yes, thank you. And you are? Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Thank you for this. Attend this meeting and it's public. Um, this is the first chance I've ever had to go, come to one. I just want to remind everybody that in May, we froze the water and sewer rates because this coming spring, we will have to undergo another study as to um, what to raise them to or if they're going to stabilize. My contention or my point in trying to freeze them, because I'm, I'm the one that proposed that we freeze the water and sewer rates was that with the Hampton Inn coming on board and with Hillcrest coming on board, they will start with H, um, that we would have more users and that would help stabilize the increases. So we don't know either what they're going to be, but I will tell you that they will probably be doing this study prior to our budget session so that if we do need to raise the rates or adjust them in any way, that that's the time that'll happen. So I wanted to give you some background on that. Um, the other thing that caught me eye, and I'll probably write to uh, 
our city manager to take a look at it, is the, the pilot portion. Um, I gotta take a look at our ordinances and compare the, the language in the ordinances to how that pilot is actually applied. Um, since this portion was broken out for the scattered home sites, I wanna make sure that that's... That's, a, that's an absolute guesstimate that'll have to be finalized by our accountants based on the formula agreed to between HUD and the city in 1967, so. I, I wanna take a look at that. Yeah. No. Thanks. It, it just, it raised the night and thought, not all of those, our housing is in the city, correct? They are, no, all of them are in the city. All of them are? Mm -hmm. Even, aren't we up on Reitz's Hill, is that still city? Yes, mm -hmm. we're all in city property. Okay. All of our properties on the scattered sites are in city. Because I did a quick estimate, and it's like sixty-four dollars a month per house yeah. for water, which, in the big picture, is. But they're just one bedroom. But it, well, I'm yeah. thinking that's an average because there's more than just one. No, bedroom. she said they're just water is for one bedrooms. Right. Th that thirty-four thousand. But we also have to pay water. residents who are, um, whose um, rent is here and their um, utility allowance is up here, puts in what's called negative rent. Mm -hmm. And so we're paying 30, 40, $50 a month on some of them to directly to the utility company, water company, you know, a gas company. You know, it goes directly to the providers mm -hmm. that we sent. So that's also incorporated into those charges because we have to. Because some of them have frozen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And those usually are in the larger bedroom ones. Yeah. Dale? Yes. You have another public uh, comment. Yes. Sharon Marsh. I was here last month. And I have the same question. Century Terrace has 119 units, four of which are two bedroom. That's 114 one bedroom units. Unless Riverside has different stipulations, I don't understand how a family or a couple and a child can live in a one bedroom unit because those units are very small. So I guess I don't understand how that is being allowed. Is there a more appropriate venue for this to be I, I can provide some basic information on occupancy standards um, first of all um, an individual or a couple may have a child or children in those at Century Terrace or Harborview um, because they are guardians or because of sub, sub other special arrangements that are legally approved and um, still be a disabled person or still be um, an elderly person. A disabled person can be anywhere from 18 years old and up. And so those buildings except disabled individuals and a disabled person can apply there and be accepted. Um, under previous public housing regulations, um, if a family petitioned that we will live in a one bedroom unit rather than be homeless, we had to supply the housing. Under the new occupancy standards that we have now that it's no longer public housing, we don't necessarily have to follow that. However, anyone who was a public housing resident at the time of conversion to the RAD project, maintains all the rights that they had under public housing. So I don't know offhand if we even have any families with children living at Century Terrace at this point. I don't know of any families that would be in a one bedroom unit. Okay, so that there's the four bedroom units possibly have children? Is it what? The, the larger units. Are the two bedroom units possibly have children then? They could. Yeah. Okay. They could. Mm -hmm. Okay.
but there has been. Maybe I am wrong, maybe I've been misled. There, but yeah. I talked to a lady that left Sentry Terrace two years ago because of children running in, up and down the hallway. There probably could, I mean, in, in these days, you may have, in, in, in other circles that I'm in, we do know of kids, young, and uh, teens that are what we call couch surfing I understand. with family and friends. So they may be there, but they may not really be part of a family. Um, you know, so that you probably could have kids up and down the hallways because... When Century Terrace was strictly a HUD program, you could have visitors, but they were there for a limited time. Mm -hmm. They couldn't couch surf for any length of time. There was a deadline. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was two weeks, 10 days, I don't remember. But there was a deadline. Just curious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I would say last night on my way out of the office, I spoke with a grandmother who was waiting for her granddaughter um, because she does gap watching as right. a teen with some disabilities. But between when school ends and when mom and dad are off work, and so. Understandable. That, uh, it's not living. So I was just curious. Yep. Yeah. Nope, I think we're good. So moved. A second.